It's very extended. And last year we only ended up having, I think it was a total of like nine games, but our, our normal length season is like minimum, I think 24. Okay. So it was really condensed because of COVID and we did like a bubble type tournament with the teams in the league. And they actually, we were in Utah. So our team ended up getting bought out by some owners here in Kansas city. So I'm now in Kansas city. Um, but we were in Salt Lake just before this and we hosted the tournament. So we didn't have to leave, but all the teams came and they basically stayed in Utah for a month and a half in like hotels, um, some of the like academy apartments that they had close to the facility we played at. So it was quite an experience, but we were lucky to, we were actually the first, it's funny because it's not really, we, were, we didn't really get recognized as a league, but we were the first league to successfully complete like basically a season um, where there were no positive COVID tests within the bubble, which is pretty cool. But it's funny because they say, I think the NBA was the first, but technically our league was, but you know, women's soccer is not exactly the biggest sport in the US. So yeah, it's so different. Uh, so I can take you through a little bit of last year because last year, basically we got, I got to Utah, um, like beginning of March and so close to this time last year. And then I got there about a week and a half early because I usually get there a little bit early to acclimate to the elevation change because it's brutal. Um, but anyways, we ended up starting preseason and we have two days and then we're done because of COVID. A, a jazz player tested positive and some players on our team had like come in contact with him. So our team had to shut down. And then before we knew it, the whole league was shutting down. And then we didn't have any team organized practices for like three months. So we were out in Utah, basically having to like quarantine in our apartments with the exception of being able to go outside and run. So we lived right, um, like we had a trail right behind our apartment. So we basically did all of our running workouts on the cement um, for three months and we didn't have access to any gyms, but they ended up bringing some uh, lifting equipment to us at our apartments, but super limited. So for three months, that's basically what we were able to do. And then start up like really small group trainings where you basically can only do stuff with your roommate. And then we ended up having the challenge cup, which I think it started in, it was summertime. So I think it started in like July, June, July. So we were waiting months. You know, we started preseason technically in March, March, April, May, at least, yeah, three months until we were playing games. And even those games weren't promised. So we were kind of working out for a goal of playing, but not really knowing if we were ever going to be able to or not. Thankfully we did, but and then the Challenge Cup, like I said, it was a bubble. So we were quarantined to our apartments. Basically the whole year we were quarantined to our apartments, it felt like. I mean, it's, it's what we kind of sacrificed uh, to be able to play. And the fall series, so we played our Challenge Cup, had two weeks off, and then they divided us up kind of like regionally. So us in Utah, we played Portland and Seattle. So we went there to play them and then they came to us. And when we traveled, it was like, get in, get out. So we, for Portland, we literally got there the day, I think we got there the day of the game and left the day of the game. And then once that fall series was done, our season was done. And so that ended up being, giving us about two months of an off season. And normally we have between four and five. So two months home, then we get a call basically telling us our team had been sold to owners in Kansas city and kind of cool backstory. This team, actually our team in Utah had previously been the Kansas city team, okay. but the kind of ownership group and the team ended up getting bought out by owners in Utah. And then some stuff kind of went down in Utah with our owners and just the team overall. And then we got bought out by Kansas city, some new owners here, um, which is, it's really exciting, our ownership group. So that's kind of been soccer for me in the past year, I guess you could say a little bit over a year. 
um, quite a whirlwind, very different than my first season, which was a normal season because COVID wasn't happening when I first got into the league. Um, but yeah, we're back at it. And, and now we have a whole season ahead of us, including a tournament. So that challenge cup that we had, we're doing that again. And then we're having a whole nother season. So it's going to be like, now we went from playing nine games last season to this year playing, I think at least in the thirties. Okay. So yeah, it's, and, and at this, at the professional level, games are, they're so intense. So it's going to be pretty interesting to see how people do with such a heavy schedule, but hopefully everyone stays good. Yes, I'm, I'm definitely thankful I came in when I did. Um, the timing of it all was pretty perfect. And I came in during a year that was a World Cup year. So they had some extra roster spots open that they normally don't have. And it's pretty hard for rookies to get contracts because you're basically coming into a team environment where all the contracts are pretty much taken and locked in. So you're almost looking to beat somebody out who's been in the league. And so it was really, I was really fortunate to come in at the time that I did because there were open spots. So you weren't necessarily having to beat someone out. You were just basically trying to prove to them you're worth taking the time to develop. Mm -hmm. So thankfully I got an opportunity, signed with Utah, had a normal season, got to play a little bit and got to see what it's like to have that, that typical professional season. So it was nice to have that. I almost feel like last year doesn't even really count as my second year because it was so strange. But yeah, so just to go back to that, I'm definitely thankful I, I came in when I did. So as you know, I played for Kings. Um, so I got to play high school soccer for a few years and my high school career kind of got cut short because of my ACL injuries. So I had those, I, I tore it initially in um, my second year. So I, I tore it in my sophomore season and then ended up tearing it again my junior year. And so I, I really only got to play about a year and a half-ish of high school soccer. Um, but I was playing club all growing up and all throughout, you know, really up until that point of my first tear. And for me, the whole college recruitment happened pretty early on. I'd say it happened earlier on than I was ever expecting. Um, I ended up having offers from schools beginning my, in my freshman year of high school. So I was going on visits. I was having calls with coaches at the time and I was really encouraged to go and um, check out some of the camps. So if I was interested in a school that was interested in me, one of the best ways to kind of get a feel for the program is to go to their, their usually they have summer camps and it's an, like an ID camp. So you meet the coaches, you get to meet some of the players on the team. You see how the whole program runs. And I ended up doing that going into my sophomore year. I, it was coming down to the point where I felt like I was going to be ready to make a decision pretty soon. And I ended up going to the Pepperdine ID camp. It's funny though, because I actually had no clue Pepperdine had a soccer team <laughs> for like, I really didn't know until I ended up going to the camp, but my mom had encouraged me to look into it because my sister, Jessica, that was like her dream school is where she wanted to go. And just everything that my family knew about the school was, it was just amazing things. So my mom encouraged me to look into the program and I did, and I ended up deciding to go to the camp and I just like hands down fell in love with the program loved the coaching staff, um, the girls that were on the team at the time who were working the camps were amazing. I'm still in contact with them to this day, which is really cool. Uh, so just all around it, Pepperdine totally won my heart. And so I ended up committing to Pepperdine, I think it was like the beginning of my sophomore year of high school, um, like, like fall and ended up committing there it kind of came down to about three or four schools that I had really like narrowed down my list to and ultimately ended up picking Pepperdine. So glad I did still best, one of the best decisions I've ever made. I'm so happy with my experience overall there. 
and I don't think I'd be where I am today if, if it wasn't for Pepperdine. But um, the whole recruitment, it was interesting too because I had committed so early, which was great, but I obviously still had so many more years of playing in club and in high school or so I thought before I was gonna even get to Pepperdine. And then that all took a turn when I tore my ACL both times. Um, wasn't really even playing soccer for almost three years leading up to going to Pepperdine. So my freshman year at Pepperdine, I remember it was the summer going in, I played my first games back. So my first game really at Pepperdine was one of my first games back playing, coming off of those two and a half-ish years of having not played competitively. And I was going into this division one environment where you're playing with some amazing players. Um, you know, it, it was, it was nerve wracking for sure. Um, but I ended up kind of finding my footing and I was recruited as a forward, but I ended up getting kind of rotated into the defensive line. So I'm actually now an outside back, which you would think is totally opposite of what I'd grown up playing, but the way it's played today, it's, it's funny, you find most outside backs had been forwards at one point in their career. Um, and I also think if I hadn't been moved to that position also, I don't think I'd be here playing professionally because that's what I play currently. Um, so that was kind of my experience uh, with recruiting. And like I said, Pepperdine was just the best. I think they're like some of the best years of my life. And I am so, so thankful for Tim, the coach, he, he didn't take away my scholarship. And that was something that definitely was a possibility. You know, two ACL tears, that's, those are intense injuries, especially as a soccer player. And durability wise, you kind of doubt sometimes, will I be able to do it? Like, will I be able to come back and be 100% and be the player I was when they were recruiting me and offering me an initial spot on the team? So kind of having to almost prove to him that he made a good decision in honoring the original commitment that he had made me. So ended up working out really well. And yeah, so that, that was, I hope that answers all of that um, with my whole like recruiting journey. I think just looking back at those years, it's funny because I tell people a lot of the time it's, if those, if those injuries hadn't happened to me, I don't know. I really don't know where I would be with soccer. Um, I don't know if I'd still be playing. I really don't know where my soccer journey would have taken me or if it would have ended, you know, even after high school or after college. And I think during those two years of sitting out, I almost like grew a new kind of sense of like thankfulness for for the sport and for the opportunity to pursue it at, you know, one of the highest levels playing division one college soccer and a dream that I had had since I was a little girl. And it was discouraging at times. Obviously you're going through an injury that it doesn't, it's not, nothing's ever guaranteed. You're not guaranteed to come back 100%. You're not guaranteed to come back and be able to do the things that you were able to do before. And then having done it twice, it's like, again, it's like those odds just, it's, it's less and less your chance of kind of being the player you once were. So seeing, you know, have, having to go through the rehab process and not being able to play and not knowing kind of what my future would look like with soccer, but having to still stay on that path of recovering and getting better and, and realizing that I still have the opportunity to go on to play in college. I think that was something that really kept me pushing. And I definitely doubted so many times if I would be kind of the player that I was. And I think a huge reason why I was put in the position of, of an outside back was because I had fear. Um, I was a forward and, and the way that I was injured, it was on a breakaway both times. And so I think this drive that I had had for so long of like being a goal scorer and being someone that was super aggressive in the attack, 
it's almost like I, it's not that I lost it, but it just something shifted mentally for me. And my coaches could see that and ended up putting me in a different position that would lessen my chance of getting into a situation like that. So, and again, it's, I think back and I'm like, if I had not been injured and I was still a forward and I went on to play college soccer and I was a forward, would I have been drafted? Who knows? Cause I actually love like the position I play now. I love it even more. So it's funny how that stuff works, but, but anyways, it was discouraging for sure. But like I said, I think I had those thoughts in the back of my mind of, I owe it to my future coaches and my future teammates and to myself to give this 100% of my energy in getting better and coming back and leave the rest kind of up to God. Like at that point, there, there's stuff that's out of your hands. And I felt like if I did everything on my end, then I'd have no regrets. Um, and if it worked out for me, it did. If it didn't, at least I can look back and, and say I did everything that I could. So that's kind of that part of my story. And I'm thankful that I stuck with it. Um, because like I said, Pepperdine would not have gone there if it wasn't for soccer. Um, and then obviously where I am now. Injuries are part of the game. You realize, I don't know many, especially like I look at my teammates now and just, you look at the injuries everyone's gone through and it's unlikely that you find someone who hasn't been through a very serious injury. Cause when you've been playing so long, the chances of getting injured obviously get higher, but you kind of figure the ones that push through it and the ones that find a way to kind of overcome. And obviously there are some injuries that are like impossible to come back from, but I feel like if, if it comes down to you having that opportunity to like push through it, good things can, can definitely happen, so. Those four years were huge. I think I had, I think probably the most development that I had ever had was in those four years. Like I said, I was shifted to a new position pretty early on. So because of that, I was forced to totally change my mindset. Now I was someone basically like stopping goals from happening as opposed to being the one scoring them. So that just learning a whole new position and having to adjust to that, that like way of playing was so different than I had ever experienced because I was playing a whole, like a whole different position for years prior. Um, but I think I also look back on those four years and I think for me, yes, I developed for sure, overall, and my soccer abilities and my technical abilities, my tactical understanding of the game, the mentality side of it is, as well. Um, but I think even more so, that program really shaped me into who I am. And just the things that the program really kind of focused on, it was, it was all about creating like women of character and it's a faith-based program. And it was something that I really wanted when I was looking for a program to enter into for college. And because of that, the people that you're surrounded by, I mean, I was surrounded by some of the best people that I know and people that mean the world to me to this day. Um, like I said, I think that program really changed my life. Um, and yeah, I, I think back to some of the things that we went through on the field and all the highs, all the lows. It's almost like it didn't matter because at the end of the day, we were all being really like tested, but also shaped into like women of character. And maybe we didn't even know it at the time, but now I look back and I look at what I was like my freshman year and then just when I graduated my senior year and how far I had come. Um, and I'm so thankful for that whole experience because for sure, I mean, just some of the greatest, greatest memories that I hold on to, so. You know, when you have a little bit of a platform, obviously, it gives you an opportunity to share the things that you're passionate about outside of your, your job. And 
I've actually had some incredible conversations with fans about faith and with my teammates and, and with people that I've met in the organizations that I've been able to work with. And it's been incredible just to see how doors open and relationships are formed. And um, yeah, it's, it's given me so many different avenues of being able to share something that is important to me. Um, and I feel like I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that part of my life. So the least I can do is, is share about that when I have the opportunity. And you do have to be careful because <clears throat> this is a professional environment and you are technically like in the workplace. And sometimes you need to, you kind of keep faith in the workplace separate in a sense. But I feel like with what I do, it's cool because I've been given a lot of freedom, like especially with my social media and, and, and things that I can almost like put into messages that I deliver, whether that's interviews or almost like inadvertently talking about it because it's a big part of me. So I feel like there's no way to really leave it out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been really cool to, to see how doors have opened and I've been able to share a lot of my story um, and that part of me. So yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been really great. It's funny because I actually don't really, my story is a little bit different in the fact that I wasn't actually trying really to play after. Um, I think going into college, I had aspirations of trying to play professionally once I graduated. And then come my junior, senior year, I was pretty set on just starting a career and something else that I really loved. So I had like a bunch of inter interviews set up and internships I was gonna have my second semester of my senior year and then that all changed when I got drafted. And so for me, I think it's funny. I think I played the best soccer of my life my senior year um, because I, I played with this freedom of, I just wanna enjoy this. I just wanna love playing because who knows how much longer I'm gonna play for. These could be my last competitive games I ever play in my life of the game that I've been playing since I was, before I could even walk. So I'd say, I think that was a huge year for me because I play the best when I'm just almost like carefree, no pressure, like there's no pressure, just got to play for my, my school, play for my team, my coaches, and, and then the chips just kind of fell how they did for me. Um, but I'd say for someone who is trying to pursue playing, especially if they are playing Division One or they are playing in college, I'd say if you're really focused and you really feel like it is something that you do want to do, I believe there is a place for anyone. I mean, there is obviously a skill requirement and there are things that need to be met in order to play, but I mean, I have teammates that I played with in school uh, at Pepperdine that are playing all over the world. So I just got fortunate to have an opportunity here in the US, but I've had teammates go over overseas because they didn't have an opportunity here, then come back and they're doing really well in the league. I've had teammates go overseas and don't wanna even come back to play in the US because they love it so much. And everyone has a place, everyone has a team. And if you really want it that bad, I believe like you can go and play anywhere. There's so many different leagues around the world for women's soccer that people don't know about um, and different like divisions. So there's different levels of professional soccer. Um, but yeah, it's, it's almost hard for me to answer that question because I, my story, like I said, is just so different. I wasn't really even expecting to play after. Um, so yeah, but I think that's probably what I would say. Just if you want it, go for it. What do you have to lose? <laughs> yeah, I was, it's funny because I actually grew up, I loved watching. So I would record like all Champions League games. I watched a lot of the EPL and um, the Italian leagues and the Spanish league and so I grew up wa loving watching the game and sometimes for even some players that make it to the professional level and are some of the greatest players. Like, I don't know, they might not love watching soccer. Some people don't, but 
I loved it from a really early age. And I think that's something that I actually look back on and I'm really thankful for because I learned so much from watching. You learn so much from watching. And I think you don't think about it sometimes, you're just watching. But the more you watch in that repetition, I think you see it reflected in your play. Um, I'm the type, I'm like a really visual learner. So seeing film and seeing my mistakes and seeing things that I did do well helps me personally a lot. Not everybody is that way, but I remember in college going into my coach's offices almost every day watching film because I just had this desire to get better and I had this desire to like almost be called out for the things that I felt like I needed to be working on and have someone other than myself telling me, you know? So I watched, like I said, I watched so much soccer growing up. And then, especially when I got to college, watching film of myself was huge. And now at the professional level, I remember my first year in particular, my rookie season, I watched film for hours, hours um, when I was playing. and just seeing, you know, being really critical. Cause I think the more critical you are of yourself, you don't want to be so critical that you just, you don't think you're good. But I think it's important to be critical and to expect high standards because if you limit yourself, then you're just, you're not doing yourself any good. Yeah. So film helps you to really push yourself. Um, and yeah, I, I love it. And I still definitely take advantage of it to this day um but yeah I definitely I started watching soccer so early so I would recommend it if someone is interested in like getting better and it helps you with your tactical understanding and technically you see you see players do things and you give it a try when you have a ball and you're out at the field and who knows you add it to your game and it's it's little things like that that you don't think about but you can pick up on that when you watch film so I'd highly highly recommend it I don't know many girls who I was growing up playing with in club that would like watch like three games in a row on the weekends because I like couldn't get enough. It was so funny. But, and then I'd go outside in the backyard with my ball right after and be kicking it around. So, but you also don't want to force it. And I think that was something my parents did a really good job at. They never forced me. It was if I wanted to, I was out there with the ball. If I wanted to, I was watching soccer. Um, some parents can be like very like kind of controlling in that aspect if they really want their kid to be good at something. But I was so thankful that my parents were just really supportive of my passion and never made me feel like I was being forced to play or being forced to pursue it any further than I ever wanted to. So I loved it. And it's funny because that all or nothing documentary I was obsessed with it. I think I watched it. I binge watched that for sure. Um, but that gives you a really good look into like a, a day in the life of a pro soccer player. Mm -hmm. They obviously have a very, very like intense, like um, incredible setup because they've been around for so long mm -hmm. and soccer in Europe and soccer in England is just huge. Um, but that it was a really good like depiction of what it's like it's there's a lot of sacrifices but there's also like so much amazingness that comes with being able to pursue the sport at the highest level so it's cool that people got to look inside of what it's like because people don't know you know you watch a game but you don't know everything else that goes on the other like 23 hours of a day you know it's like you see 90 minutes but you don't see all of the other hours of work that the players put in to prepare for those 90 minutes so I thought they did such a good job at showing that really well um I mean it, it's very different in a lot of aspects like I said soccer in London especially men's soccer in the Premier League it's been around for so long that it's so established so they're definitely you know I mean, it's just so, you can't compare in a lot of aspects, but the sacrifice is very similar. I think the effort and the work and the hours, it's the same. That's the same. Um, and when it's your career, I mean, it's basically like if you have a nine to five job, it's like you're at work for those hours and then you go home and you don't really think about work so much. Mm -hmm. 
But for us, it's like, yeah, we might only practice for an hour and a half, two hours in a day, but those other hours of the day, you're preparing your body for the next day, you know, because that hour and a half isn't just kind of like kick around um, at this level. It's hard work. And so it's, yeah, I, I think all that, you don't necessarily think about that when you're not in it because you watch as a fan and it's 90 minutes and then you think they go home and eat dinner with their families and all that. And they might, but it's just, it's intense. It's a lot of work and um, yeah. And, but, it, but again, I mean, it's amazing to be able to do it and experience it for sure. So the day before a game is, looks a lot different than like three, four days out. So, so the day before a game usually, um, so we haven't had a game here in Kansas City. So I, I don't know exactly what it's going to look like here, but my rookie season when we'd play, usually we were having games around 7.30 at night. So <clears throat> if we had a home game, I'd wake up whenever I ended up waking up. And then just kind of have that day to do what I what I wanted. I usually make breakfast, go to like one of my favorite coffee shops, sit there for a little bit, call people from home, hang out with some of the girls. And then just kind of a few hours before leaving for the stadium, I would just be by myself just for a little bit and kind of prepare mentally. And then you get to the stadium about two hours before kickoff get all you kind of like do some mobility stuff in the weight room before you go out for um warm-ups and then you go out for warm-ups and then you end up playing the game and then you go home and it, i remember it it's like so hard to sleep that night of like the game we i, I remember it was my second game and there were eighteen thousand people at our game we we're playing chicago on i think it was like a friday night <laughs> And we won the game one to nothing. And it was a huge win. Um, I remember going home that night and just not being able to fall asleep because the adrenaline, you it's like it doesn't run out when you're done playing. It's just still there. <laughs> so and then you wake up the next morning just exhausted because you didn't get very good sleep. But and you like are sore from the game. But yeah, it was wild I hadn't experienced anything like that because college soccer is just so different <laughs> than the pro level you play like two games in a weekend in college and the pro level you're playing a game every like five days oh wow five yeah. like five days maybe a week um so yeah it's that's kind of what a typical day and then like a normal practice day like what I did today I got up um around like seven fifteen, made breakfast hung out for a little bit, ended up going in to get some treatment. And then we ended up having practice at 10, 10 to 11.30, went and got coffee, came home, and I've been here ever since. So it's kind of just like a normal day. Um, that's what it looks like. Sometimes we'll have a lift. So we'll have a practice and then we'll have a few hours in between then we lift. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's nothing super crazy, but just preparing for the games. I think like the biggest thing you obviously think of a pro player and you think of them like if you're the best of the best at something you would think you would be getting paid as if you're the best of the best you know and I am not someone that likes to talk about m money honestly I don't um but I do think it's really important that people are aware that women's pro professional soccer players here in the U.S. do not make the type of money that really any other pro sport makes especially you compare the men's to women's and it's very skewed um and that's partly because like our league is really young so we're, our league is just not as established as like the nba mlb even the mls so it's just different and you really realize i'm play because i love it i don't play because i'm making tons of tons of money mm -hmm. but you really kind of realize that's why i said it's like a very big sacrifice at times to pursue this lifestyle um and you you give up a lot like i said you realize really why you do what you do it's not for that but it's because you really love it and i'm not saying people that make a lot of money playing sports don't love it because i don't think that's true 
but I just think it makes you realize more when you aren't making that type of money, you know, is it worth it to keep going? And yeah, so I think that's a very big misconception Mm -hmm. that just because you're a pro player, you make a lot of money because that's not necessarily true with our league. That I've had to defend. Um, I've defended some pretty good forwards in this league. Um, I think, so I, my first year, um, so Kristen Press, uh, she plays for the national team. She is, so she was on my team my rookie season. And any time I had to defend her in practice was like, pray to God, she does not get the ball. <laughs> One of the best forwards I've ever, ever played with or against. Um, So I'd say that she was one of, she probably was the player that I would, I mean, I liked it at the same time because it was so challenging, but it was hard work. And so, but I think also one of the players that I played with that I admire so much, I never defended her because she's a defender, but who plays the game I feel like as close to perfect as you can is Becky Sauerbrunn. Um, She was also on my team my rookie season and I got to play next to her actually, which was unreal. And just someone who knows the game so incredibly well and who is such a good teammate, someone who is like not prideful and she has reasons to almost be in a sense because of her accolade and everything she's accomplished, but she's proof that you can have all that and you can be so humble which I appreciated so much um, to see that and experience experience that. So those two players, and I have incredible teammates and have been able to play with and against some of the best. Um, And I'm super thankful for that. I've gotten to play with people that I've looked up to for years. Um, So yeah, I'd say that was, those are two players for sure that I am very thankful that I got to be teammates with. It was really (laughs) hard, especially when I first met like Kelly O'Hara too. Mm. I remember I was just like, I needed to just keep my cool because I'm like, now I'm teammates with them. It's not like, like we're on the same, like we are teammates. Um, I can't be like a fan, you know? But I think they knew how much I admired them. Yeah, that was also playing with Kelly was a, like a dream because I had watched her for so, so long. And I was learning from her because she was an outside back. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I've been very fortunate. Kelly, for sure, especially that first year, was like a mentor to me. I think she taught me so much and took the time like to get to know me and, and want to help me, which was really cool because she didn't have to do that. Um, and I loved, I loved that. I love the relational aspect of being on a team. Mm-hmm. So, and then having a friendship with someone you've looked up to for so long that you feel like you can learn so much from, it was unreal. So I'm super thankful for that. Yes. Oh my gosh. I, I mean, going in, I'm not going to lie. I did not even pack a lot because not that I didn't have confidence. I, I don't, I do think I struggled with confidence, but I think I just, in my head was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to play with these girls. They're so good. And then I ended up, you know, getting a contract and end up playing. And it was like, wow, I guess I was, or am good enough. Um, but it was so nerve wracking at first and the, the speed of play is so fast compared to college and you're playing with girls where everyone is so good you know in college you play with girls that are like kind of they're like there for the team aspect or they're there because they do love to play but they you know it's like they leave practice they don't really think about soccer that much but you're playing with girls that it's like this is their life mm-hmm. but then once you get into the hang of it it's so fun because playing at that speed and playing with people that think similar to how you think it's, I mean, it's, I think, I think it brings out the best in you. And I think it brought out the best in me, especially when I was coming into this environment that I wasn't sure how it was going to do. Um, and yeah, so it was definitely nerve wracking, but I think you kind of have to get over that whole, I am young and just be like, you know what? I have nothing to lose. You know, I'm not a name. I'm not someone that people know about. So I'm just going to go in there and give it my best and see what happens. I remember meeting with my assistant coach at Pepperdine, his name's Max. He is a sports psychologist and he had me write down a list 
of all the things that I wanted, of all the things that I wanted out of my pro career. And then he had me write this list of the things that I wanted like for that season, that first season going in. And he basically told me, he was like, if you look at the things you want for the future and the things that you want currently, they kind of, there's some things that kind of conflict because the things you want in the future require you to have experienced things. And he said, but if you look at the things that you want now, those are things that are attainable. And he was like, if you focus on achieving the things that you want now, that is going to set you up for the things that you want later. And at times it's hard for us to like compartmentalize and we get caught up in, oh, this is what I want to be. This is what I want people to know me as. This is what I want out of my life, or this is what I want for my instance out of my pro career. But I think that first season, especially I did a good job of of seeing what I wanted for that season and really not looking too far ahead. Because if you plan too far ahead, you kind of set yourself up for disappointment sometimes because things get thrown into the equation that you weren't accounting for. Did I think I was going to have back-to-back ACL tears? No, not at all. So it's like having gone through that experience set me up for understanding things later in my career, just as an example. But after having that kind of session with him of talking about that and sharing with him like my dreams of what I want and the dreams that I want currently really helps me keep kind of like a firm foundation of I need to be really good about kind of staying true to myself and really like living into these things that I want and desire right now. And then hopefully doing that will set me up at some point to achieve the things that I want later down the road. So I'd say that's probably was a huge thing for me going into that whole experience and something that I still think about to this day um, that I hold dear to me because I just think it's so applicable. And, and it, that goes for anyone. That doesn't have to go for just a pro athlete. I feel like that's just a good thing in life to have a grasp on. So yeah, I think that's huge. Something I definitely still still think about for sure. So it's so important. If you think too far ahead, I really think you kind of just set yourself up for disappointment. So got to just live in the now. I'll start with the most difficult thing. I think the most difficult thing about being a pro player is for sure, you know, the schedule, it's like I'm away from home for so long. So it's hard sometimes, especially with COVID, I wasn't able to see my family. That was the longest I had gone my entire life without seeing my family. which was hard for me. Um, but I also think the one of the best things about being a pro player, it's the people that you meet and the people that like become like family and people that leave a mark on your life that you never would have really expected. So for me, something it's like being, being away from home has been really hard, but at the same time, it's allowed me to grow and it's brought so many other amazing people into my life and I'm so, so thankful for that, for the friendships that I've made and the people that now play such a significant role in my life. So I'd say that is, and then obviously, I mean, financially it can be difficult. It's been nice to almost just still not focus on that because I'm, it's like, it's fine financially, you're, it's fine. But um, again, it's like you find another reason why you love it. Confidence, anxiety, even I feel like bouts of like depression sometimes that can be, those can be real things um, for anyone. And when you're in an environment where what you do is really like performance based and it's, it's at times it seems like kind of conditional, um, <clears throat> nothing is ever guaranteed you can be starting, you could be playing every game, 90 minutes, and then all of a sudden you're on the bench. You know, if you find your worth, if you find your identity and your love for playing in the minute you get on the field, what's going to happen if you don't get that, you know? And so then people can, can really go into dark places because of that. And I think what is so important 
and this goes for anyone, is to have those people in your life that you can go to and you can be real and transparent and honest about the things that you feel and the things that are making you doubt or the things that are making you feel like you're not good enough. And people that hold you accountable, but also encourage you. Encouragement is huge, so huge. It is so important just as much as you need to be on someone and, and keep them honest and make sure that they're being held accountable, you have to also encourage because there has to be this, yeah, you know what? Maybe this isn't your day or maybe you aren't going to be playing in this game, but like we believe that you can get back into the starting lineup or we believe that if you do this, this, and this, it gives you a good chance to set yourself up for success. You can't ever get so like high above the clouds when things are going really well because in the moment you kind of like snapped out of that dream you can go into a really dark place and you want to stay so grounded the whole time consistently just maintaining this kind of good mentality good attitude regardless of the situation because there's going to be a time when you're called upon and there's going to be a time when you thought you'd be called upon and you're not, or you're used to being called upon and you aren't this time. But it's continuing to push and continuing to move forward if you love it. You know, maybe you've come to a, a decision that maybe it's not meant for you. You know, you might have played for a few years and you feel like you're, com you're comfortable being done. But <clears throat> I feel like you have to stay rooted in kind of like what else you find your identity in, right? And that looks different for different people. But I think you have to have people around you. You have to. I have people outside of this team that I feel like 100% comfortable going to who will like be honest with me, keep me accountable, but also encourage me and have to stay grounded because you never know what the day is going to bring, honestly. I would love to work at some point for a nonprofit. Um, I've had experience working with nonprofits that specialize in like working with kind of like recovering victims of sex trafficking. And it's something that I am very passionate about. And I also think it would be really cool at the same time i'd love to coach i think soccer will always be a big big you know thing in my life and um i love working out and training and i feel like there's so many things that i can do to keep that in my life but i feel like post college or post soccer career um that's what i'd love to do and i want to like plant those seeds now to prepare for that because I feel like there are so many amazing organizations out there. They might not even be nonprofits, but they work with that demographic. And I'd love to do, I would love to do that. For a while, actually, I thought of be, doing like social work. Um, and who knows, maybe I go back to school. I don't really know, but I do know that my heart is like totally in that space of working with, with people that honestly need help. So that's what I want to do post soccer and it actually makes me so excited because I think sometimes you get locked into like this is my career this is what I'm doing that you don't think about like well what's going to happen when this is done and then you get lost and you don't know what to do with your life but I think I have a good grasp on when this is done my life is still going to be really really full and it's just going to be a new chapter so where soccer plays a little bit of a different role in my life and I feel like, I don't know how far off that is. I don't know if it's sooner than later, but I feel like regardless of when that comes, I'll be ready for it. So yeah.